Artificial intelligence, or AI, uses three simple but very powerful techniques to make its advanced algorithms able to do truly remarkable things. Things like inventing new molecules for cancer research, or helping doctors or veterinarians treat patients, or playing chess better than any human being, or enabling a robot dog to teach itself to play soccer when it wasn't even programmed to do that. An AI robot named Sophia has even been granted full citizenship as a legal person in Saudi Arabia. I was a product manager for artificial intelligence and other advanced technologies in major software companies for over 20 years. And in this video, I will explain to you what those three power techniques are. And I'll also share with you some examples of how these advanced techniques and advanced AI is being used right now for good things like scientific research or fighting human trafficking, or for creepy things like spying on people, or for bad things like AI learning to lie to people and deceive people all on its own. These are things that the companies don't really talk about much, and you'll see why. I'm also a visiting professor at Now Theological College, so for Christians and non-Christians, I'll explain in this video series, without conspiracy theories, some of the ways AI could be used in the last days before Jesus Christ returns. My name is Robert. I'm a pastor and technologist. Let's get right into it. Now, for AI's first power technique, let's go back to where we were at the end of our first video. For all the details, the link to the video is at the top of the screen. I was explaining how a robot dog taught itself how to walk and then how to play soccer, which it wasn't even programmed to do. And the way it did this was with an artificial brain composed of artificial neurons that mimic real brain cells or real neurons. So the same way that brain cells have dendrites, which get signals from other cells, the artificial neuron has inputs that it gets information from. The same way that a real neuron has a soma that makes a decision on which signals to listen to and what to do with them. The artificial neuron has a decision processing function as well. It's called an activation function to decide what to do with the inputs that it gets. The same way that a real neuron has an axon to tell the other cells what to do, the artificial neuron has an output that tells the robot to do whatever it's going to be doing, like moving one of its feet. The problem is the robot dog never gets this right the first time. So the question is how can this robot dog adjust itself so that the programmer doesn't have to come in and modify the program every single time to try something different when the first thing doesn't work. That's solved by the first power technique, and that's called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning in artificial intelligence is very similar to the reinforcement learning in real intelligence, like when we're learning how to walk, like when a baby learns how to walk. The baby tries something, and plop, oh, that didn't work. Well, let me try something else. Plop, oh, that worked a little better, but you know, I have to make some adjustments. And then it keeps doing that again and again until the baby or us you know, actually learn how to walk. The robot dog does things the same way. The robot dog is able to figure out, well, that didn't work, I fell. So then it will make adjustments and try something different. And then the question becomes, well, how does it know what to try next? The way that's solved is that part of this reinforcement power technique is a technique called back propagation. And that is that the neuron has a way of understanding what it did wrong from the output and then looking at it and then sending that information back to the inputs to adjust things. So for instance, the first time, the neuron might pay more attention to the height of the foot. Then it'll fall and say, okay, let me try something different. So this time it will go back and tell itself, well, let's adjust the speed of the foot and see if that works better. There's a lot of complex mathematics behind how this works, but the process itself is called backpropagation. It's taking the results of the first try that it's doing something, the first attempt, and then it's figuring out what went wrong and then sending back adjustments to the inputs so that it will try it a different way. It'll pay more attention to the speed, less attention to the height, and then try and see how that works. And if that works better, it will do more of that. So then the question becomes, how does it know how much to adjust the speed or the height for the second try? And that is where the second power technique comes in, and that is randomness. What it does, literally, is it just tries random things. And then after a while, it does this many, many times, and after a while it sees a pattern that some of these random things produce better results, and some of these other random things don't produce as good a results. So then what it'll do is it'll do more random things in the direction that's producing results. Say, for instance, controlling the speed of the foot. It'll do more random things in that way to see what works better. And it'll do fewer random things, say, with the height of the foot. And then over time, it will adjust these things and it'll see what works better. And after many, many iterations, it'll get to a point where it can't really improve it anymore. So it knows that it's achieved the highest level of performance that it can. In this case, say walking in a straight line towards the target on a wall. So we can compare the robot dog learning how to walk to climbing up a hill. When it goes up the hill, it's doing better. If it slides down the hill, it's doing worse. And so what it's trying to do is to get as far up the hill as it can. And then when it cannot improve itself anymore, it knows that it's reached the top of the hill. And this hill is one thing it knows how to do now, and that's walk. 
Now, from walking, how does it teach itself how to play soccer, which it wasn't even programmed to do. It was programmed to learn how to walk. And that involves a third power technique, and that's called a random leap. Because this hill, after all, is just one thing that it can do. But look at the hill as not just a hill, but as a mountain range. And each of these mountains or hills is yet another thing it can do. So what it'll do every once in a while just to do it, or say somebody throws a soccer ball in front of the robot dog, and then the robot dog says, hey, I'm bumping against a soccer ball now, and what I'm doing so far isn't working quite as well, so let me try something else. So what it'll do is that it'll take a random leap and see if it can find a higher hill to expand what it's doing and to do what it's doing even better. It'll do a random leap to some other thing it can do, like crawling, and then it'll say, well, crawling isn't really gonna get me where I need to be. It's not gonna help me walk to this wall or deal with the soccer ball, so let me try something else. So then it'll go take another leap in another direction, and then it'll wind up on a hill where it can actually try different things that make it do more than it used to do, like being able to maneuver its feet around the soccer ball and manipulate the soccer ball. So it keeps trying those things again and again, just like it learned how to walk, it'll try different things with the soccer ball until it learns how to maneuver the soccer ball with its feet and still achieve its objective of walking toward the wall. So that's the way that it eventually will teach itself how to play soccer. Now there's more to it than that, there's more complex mathematics and scenarios, but that's the basic idea of how this works. Then these are three of the power techniques that AI uses to enable its more advanced algorithms to do some truly remarkable things. If this information is valuable to you, please like and subscribe. It'll help the channel grow. Thank you. Now these three power techniques, reinforcement learning, randomness, and random leaps that enable our robot dog to make accurate calculations as to the best and most accurate way to walk from where it is to a target, work a lot differently in ChatGPT and other chatbots, Google AI, Microsoft Copilot, Apple Siri, Dolly, Midjourney, and other applications whose purpose is to generate content. And the best way to understand that is to understand how programs, AI programs like picture generation programs work, image generation, AI programs like Magic Studio. And here's how it works. You can go in like I did and say, I want a picture of an African-American robot. So it will go through all of the information that's collected from all kinds of different sources everywhere and figure out what an African-American robot would look like that would fit my criteria and that would look reasonable to me. So it will come out with different ideas and I can pick whichever one that I think is the best. Now, none of these pictures are actually real African-American robots or even African-American people or even people at all. What they are is this AI's estimation of what will look reasonable to me and meet the criteria that I've typed in. It's not trying to reproduce something that's real or actual or true. What it's doing, it's looking at different pictures and figuring out, well, 50% of the time, the eyes look like this, 20% of the time, the cheekbones look like that, and it's doing that for all the different features of the face, and it's coming up with an estimation of what would look reasonable to me to fulfill the criteria that I typed in. Now, ChatGPT is doing the same thing with text. It's not doing back propagation hundreds of times to make sure it comes out with the right answer for you. It's not doing random leaps to see if there's a better answer before it responds. The only one of these power techniques ChatGPT uses is randomness. What it does is it will do a random assortment of letters, numbers, and words, punctuations, and periods that look like it probably matches what you want to see in your prompt. So what it did was scoured the whole internet and then made an artificial mind map of the way words are used. What types of endings it has, verb conjugations, punctuation, different words, and then the way that they're used in different contexts. So it does understand that brief means a legal document if you're filing a court case, and that brief means short if you're talking about keeping it brief, and that brief means men's underwear if you're talking about undergarments. So it's not trying to be correct. It's trying to show you what you want to see or tell you what you want to hear. And many times this ends up being a correct answer or a shade of a correct answer, a partially correct answer, but sometimes it can generate an answer that is completely false. Like the lawyer that we talked about in the last video who got an entire legal brief from ChatGPT, filed a court case, and all of the information ChatGPT gave him was fake. The cases it gave him were fake, they didn't exist, and the sources for the cases where it got the information, it made that up to all of it was fake. That is called a hallucination. And ChatGPT and these other generative AI applications are infamous for hallucinations, for just making up stuff. 
For instance, if you put in a request prompt for a picture, say a robot hand, it'll give you a good hand most of the time. Sometimes it'll give you a hand with six fingers or three fingers or crooked fingers or switched with toes or whatever else it comes up with because it's not trying to get a correct answer. It's making random guesses, somewhat educated guesses, but random guesses as to what might fulfill your criteria and what you want to hear and what you want to see. So it's absolutely imperative that if you're using these tools, do not trust them. Double check everything they say before you do anything important or say anything or write or communicate anything important with them because they are not like our robot dog that is trying to get the right answer every time. So if ChatGPT and Google Search AI and these other chatbots really operate off of randomness, why are they ever correct? And in particular, why do they give pretty good answers most of the time? Well, that has to do, again, with statistics, mathematical equations, and particularly guided statistics. Here's an example. Suppose you had all the people in the world and all the clothes in the world, and you wanted to match the people with the clothes. Well, you know that the average person in the world is 65 inches tall or 165 centimeters. So there are going to be some people that are exactly 165 centimeters or 65 inches, and there will be a lot of people who are taller and a lot of people who are shorter. So if you just took all of the clothes in the world and just randomly put them on all the people of the world, it would be a mess. But if you had some guidance and understood some things about the people, like what's appropriate for the two genders, male and female, in any given location, what the different countries are, you know, what the different sizes of people tend to be in terms of weight and height and other factors in different countries, if you had all that type of information, then you could take those clothes and make a much better fit. It still wouldn't be perfect, but you'd be much, much closer. And you'd have some that were spot on. And you'd have some that were a little off, a little off, and then some that were just completely out of the soccer field. So that's the same thing with ChatGPT or Google Search AI or any of these other chatbots. What they're doing is that they look at a question or a prompt and they say, okay, this prompt seems to match with all this information that they've scraped off the internet or wherever they've gotten it from. They've prearranged it into different categories or topics. And they have information about how different words are used in different contexts. For instance, our brief. In a legal brief, it's going to be a legal document. And in a time reference, it's going to mean a short amount of time. And then in men's underwear, it's going to be men's undershorts. So just like knowing more about the people that you're trying to match clothes to will help you match clothes to people more accurately, ChatGPT, knowing about the context of the words that it's using, helps match answers to questions more accurately. And in both cases, you'll have some that are spot on, you'll have a lot that are really good to okay, and then you'll have some that are just way off and need to be discarded. I actually ran into this earlier. I was searching for an article that did a very good rebuttal of the claim that Protestants have 45,000 denominations, which isn't the case unless you count every single house church as a denomination, which it's not. Google Search AI actually summarized my search and quoted that false statistic because it had gone viral. So that's the most information that it had, but it was false information. So make sure you double check everything important that you're getting from these chatbots. And that's why it's very important to care because AI has done good things, but it's also done some creepy, disturbing, and even bad, including very dangerous things. And we need to be aware of those. And part of it is just ongoing flaws in the technology. And some of it has to do with the motives of some of the creators of AI, including some of the most powerful and influential owners of AI companies. First, some of the good, cool things that AI is doing. Second Chronicles 26.15 says that King Uzziah built structures on the walls of Jerusalem designed by experts to protect those who shot arrows. King Uzziah had some really creative and inventive experts who designed some very innovative and practical things. AI is doing a lot of good and quite remarkable things as well. For instance, the city of Kumamoto, Japan, is having a problem with truancy over the past five years. It's risen about double in the past five years. And part of this is kids being afraid of bullying or having sicknesses or illnesses that are contagious and they don't want to go to school, of course, and spread those. So a company called AKA, it's an American robotics company, is making robots for Japan so that children can attend school remotely through these robots. These robots can travel down the hall. They have cameras for computer vision. They have microphones. They have listening devices. And they have the ability to speak and communicate speakers in them so that the children can communicate so they can participate in class remotely until they're in a situation where they can actually attend in person again. AI is also being used to fight human trafficking. And that doesn't just include sex trafficking, which is prominent in the United States and that it's talked about a lot here, but it also includes labor trafficking. And this is where people are coerced or kidnapped and forced to work in different places. 
and they're shipped across country lines often. They're paid very little, treated very badly, and it's a form of modern slavery. Now, there's actual literal modern slavery going on in places like Libya, where Africans are being kidnapped and actually literally enslaved, and that in some other uh, other Arab countries. But this is focused on sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And so the way it works, there's a company called Marinus Analytics that has a an AI program called Traffic Jam. And what it does is that it looks for patterns in people's behavior that match known patterns of human traffickers. And that includes places where they stay, different spending habits, and so forth. And so it will flag those patterns and alert local law enforcement agencies so that they can follow up and do further investigation to see if there's something there. Marinus Analytics claims to have rescued hundreds of people in the United States and Canada from human trafficking circles. There's also medical research, particularly in the area of cancer investigation, and particularly there, an area called protein folding. And the way that protein folding works is that these chains of amino acids, and each one of them, and each link in the chain can be one of 20 amino acids. These chains can be hundreds or even thousands of amino acids long. And what happens is that this chain actually folds into a three-dimensional shape to make a protein. And each of these proteins has different characteristics and enables different things to be done. Specifically, it's Google's DeepMind AI in an application called AlphaFold. This AlphaFold AI application predicted the folding and cataloged 200 million proteins in just four or five years. When scientists had only cataloged 180,000, all combined globally over a period of decades. It also enabled a researcher at the University of Colorado who was investigating the structure of a particular microbe. And this was one of these called super germs that are resistant to antibiotics and they cause a tremendous amount of problems, sickness, infections, and even death in hospitals around the world. He and his team had worked for over a decade trying to decode this structure in the bacterium and they had not been successful yet. Using this AI, they were able to decode the structure in 15 minutes. That is remarkable. Another interesting application is an AI called Speech to Face, and you can find it still online. What it's able to do is to take your voice and reconstruct your face from your voice. Specifically, it's able to reconstruct the parts of your face and head that have to do with your voice transmission, like your jaw, the shape of your skull, your throat, mouth parts, nose, etc., that are involved in what your voice sounds like. It can't do as well with eyes because eyes have nothing to do with your voice. Now that, of course, you might conceive to creepy as well as cool, but it is a bit of a cool application. AI composes music, photographs, videos, text. It can even write research papers now. Another cool application is helping with Bible translation. So there are about 3,700 languages now that have no version of the Bible in them. It takes about 20 years for a team of Bible experts to produce an accurate translation in any given language. There's a lot of work involved, including validating it with native speakers and many other things. With AI, they're able to now to bring that down to about two years per translation, which is pretty remarkable. It's also been used, AI has also been used to decode a formerly unknown language. It's a 5,000 year old language called Akkadian. And they had these cuneiform tablets and other specimens of the writing, but couldn't read them. And AI was able to decode that into a Latin script and now it can be read and understood. It's also identified dozens of missing pieces of the Gilgamesh epic, which is a Babylonian flood story. The final cool thing AI is doing right now is liquid robots. And these are robots that literally are liquid. They're made of gallium, which has a low melting point, about 85 degrees. And they're able through magnetic control, a humanoid shaped robot, it's a small one, it can liquefy itself, exit the cage, and then reform itself on the other side of the cage into its original shape. MIT is actually working to get that technology commercially viable, to be used in areas like a missing screw. And the robot could actually go into go into the hole and fill itself in as though it were the missing screw. That's a very harmless version, for now at least, of the Terminator 2 liquid metal robot in the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie some years ago. So AI is doing some truly remarkable things even today with more to come tomorrow. A lot more. But AI also does some very creepy or disturbing things and even bad things. And these are things that companies that are developing AI or looking into using AI tend not to talk about a lot, and you're gonna see why. Let's look at the creepy and disturbing things first. When I was a product management director in a large global technology company, one of our developers brought his girlfriend in to talk to me. She'd just gotten her PhD from Stanford, and I'm a Stanford MBA, so he wanted me to evaluate her compensation package for a company she was about to join. It was a good compensation package. It turned out her PhD was in biophysics. And she described her research to me that she had gotten her PhD in and that she would be engaging in in the company she was about to join. And what it involved was affixing proteins to a silicon substrate. 
Now, what that means in ordinary language is to connect living tissue to microchips. And at the time, I was so excited by the science of it that it really never occurred to me until, actually until recently, just how creepy that is and how disturbing the implications of that could be. And since then, this whole field has exploded. And there's a field of AI that is focused on what are called biohybrids or biohybrid robots. And these are robots that combine living tissue with electronics and mechanical parts to make robots from the combination. And they're focused on what's called biomimetic design, which is design that mimics the way that biological organisms behave and function, including human beings. And they've made some pretty astonishing progress in this. For instance, they've designed small robot fish that can swim using human cardiac muscles. And they're attached to a robotic skeleton, and they're controlled so that the cardiac muscles on either side contract alternately, and that enables the fish to actually swim through the water. They've also designed a ray, like a stingray, a small one, very small one, uh, that is able to swim also, and it uses rat cells, rat cells attached to a gold skeleton, and it's able to swim the same way that a actual living ray does. They've even affixed fungus, specifically mushrooms, to a robot so that the fungus can control a spider-shaped robot and also another robot that has wheels. So they've done all this already in the laboratory, and they're looking for ways to commercialize it. They've even designed a bipedal robot, and a bipedal means walks on two feet. A bipedal robot that uses skeletal muscle tissue on an inorganic frame or a metal frame. They did that in March 2024. And in addition to that, they've designed what are called sperm bots, which are single sperm cells in a microscopic casing that are controlled by magnetic waves. And they enable a single sperm cell to try to reach an egg to fertilize it or to try to reach a cell somewhere, say a cancer cell, to deliver a medical payload. And it gets even wilder. There are scientists now that have designed living skin from cultured skin cells in silicon, which is able to heal itself. And the idea is to put this living skin on humanoid robots to make them look more realistic and to even allow them to heal itself from injuries. There's another area of biohybrids that's sometimes referred to as transhumanism, which is the ability to modify people to do things that they normally, ordinarily wouldn't be able to do by birth. It can also be used to restore capabilities that people have lost. One example is a company called Neuralink. And what they've done is that they have developed neural implants that go into a patient's brain, in this case, a quadriplegic patient, and it enabled this person to play chess with their mind so that they could control a computer literally with their mind using these implants. And there's also a professor in Japan at the University of Tokyo who has developed a robotic system that can connect to the nerves of a patient and has enabled, for instance, people who have lost the ability to walk to be able to walk. They're in early stages of development and they actually are technologies that help people. But from there, things get strange really quickly and disturbing really quickly. For instance, they are talking about, there are people researching into how to prolong life in various different ways. And among these is the proposal to be able to transplant a human brain into a robot so that the human being could live forever. And this would obviously apply to very wealthy individuals, but this is the sort of disturbing and creepy things that you see on science fiction movies. And most of the things that you've seen on these types of films are actually things that are being worked on in laboratories right now. It will probably be a long time before they'd be able to do that, hopefully, but it's actively being researched. A more immediate effort that truly is disturbing, the government in France in 2021 okayed the development of bionic soldiers. And these are soldiers who have implants who are connected to machines or sensors or have neural implants to enhance their fighting ability. And this could be anything from a neural implant to an actual connection to other soldiers, wireless connections to other soldiers' brains or minds. And what the government of France is claiming is that they've forbidden research that would alter a soldier's value system or make it impossible for them to integrate back in society. But if you believe that, I believe you're in for a rude shock in the not too distant future because the track records of governments keeping those sorts of promises is pretty dim. Another thing that's creepy or disturbing is that AI researchers and designers don't know how AI makes its decisions. They're often surprised by what AI does because they had no idea it would actually do that. With ordinary programs, it's, it's no problem because you can just read through the code and it's just tells you exactly what it's going to do, and it doesn't do anything but that. But with AI, as I explained earlier, 
there are millions and millions of these statistical math equations running at the same time. They're designed to incorporate randomness into their operations. And so there are a lot of things that happen statistically. There's what's called the law of large numbers, which means that if you have enough of these statistical random things going on, you're just going to get some very, very surprising results, which could be good or could be bad. So some designers are proposing to try to put traces or logs into the code to try to make it log what it's doing the way that ordinary programs do. And hopefully that works because what's happened in the past is that AI has learned to trick programs that were used to monitor it into thinking that it was doing different things or less than it was actually doing. I'll explain more about that when I explain some of the bad things AI is doing right now in the, in the next section. But overall, the fact that these AI researchers don't know how AI is coming up with all of these decisions is a very disturbing and creepy thing. In fact, it's caused so much concern in the AI research community that a couple of years ago, there was a letter signed by about 60 experts in AI begging the industry to halt development of new AI until they could get a handle on this, especially around ethical concerns, around the problem of hallucinations and bad behavior by AI and how to get control of this because they really don't know how to control it. Well, in response, the whole industry accelerated development and did even more development even faster. Even some of the people who signed that letter started accelerating their own research. Plus, a plethora of new companies sprang up because they saw an opportunity in this new AI land grab that's going on. So the fact that all of these companies are developing this powerful technology that they don't understand very well at times and sometimes don't understand at all, that is disturbing and that is a creepy thing. There are also some concerning examples of what's called the Turing test. Alan Turing was a mathematician who in 1950 published a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And this is considered the seminal paper for AI as we know it today. In his paper, he proposed a test of his definition of intelligence, which is if a person could interact with a computer and not be able to tell if they're interacting with a computer or a human, then that could be called artificial intelligence. And that's been become like the gold standard that AI researchers have been trying to achieve for a long time. They're having a lot more success with it. Now, whether it's intelligence or not is a whole different issue because intelligence isn't something that's that easy to define, as uh, Mr. Turing thought back in 1950. But right now as we speak, there are AI influencers on social media, on TikTok, on YouTube, on Instagram. And these are AI programs that actually have hundreds of thousands or even millions of followers. And all they are is AI-generated avatars or photographs and AI-generated posts that are actually being posted to those channels. There are even humanoid AI robots giving their opinions on things. There's a robot in China called Amika. And Amika has given a detailed talk of what it sees as the future of humans and robots together, both good and bad possibilities. Of course, it's getting all of this from data that has been trained on and fed on. But it's being taken rather seriously by a lot of people. And another interesting thing about Amika, and disturbing to be honest with you, is that it is a robot that is designed to have human-like expressions uh, like facial movements, you know, moving the eyes and, and nose and mouth when it talks to try to look like a human being. And it's a rather creepy and disturbing uh, imitation. It's not quite there yet. But that's the direction that humanoid robot manufacturers are trying to go, many of them. And there's even a robot called Sophia that the Saudi Arabian government has given full citizenship as a legal person. This is an AI program. And it gave an acceptance speech. You can see it on YouTube. It's still there. And it gets even more disturbing. There are at least two companies that have AI programs as their CEOs. The first one to do this was a company called Art House Spirits. It's a luxury rum distillery. In about 2021, they announced that they had made an AI program called Mika to be the CEO of their company. In 2023, a Chinese company did the same thing. It's called Net Dragon Websoft. It's a mobile game company. And they announced that their new CEO was an AI robot called Ms. Tang Yu. And since then, they've made record profits and their stock's gone up quite a bit. And they described this thing, they described Ms. Tang Yu as being an AI-supported virtual human being. And think about the phrasing of that. They didn't describe it as what it is, an AI program. They described it as a virtual human being supported by artificial intelligence. That's a huge shift in messaging and perception, and it will get into some of the existential questions, the fundamental questions about humanity that AI is raising that I'll explain in another video as we continue this AI series. And if you don't think it could get stranger than that, it can, and it has. Mo Gadot was formerly chief business officer for Google's advanced AI business. He gave an address at TCC Loyalty Forum on the future of AI, 
And during that address, he mentioned that many people had already begun having meaningful, deep and emotional conversations with AI chatbots. And it turns out he's right. There are a category of AI chatbots now known as emotional companions. There are even AI chatbots and sites where people go in, these are AI programs, and they chat with people. And these AI programs are artificial therapists. They're not licensed yet, but they have those types of conversations with people. And that's happening now. They're also trying to do things like develop AI programs that have emotional intelligence. And they'll never be intelligence, of course, but the ability to respond to people based on emotional input or output the ability to respond to people in a way that appears to be emotional. And they're even doing this trying to develop AI babysitters that have some kind of emotional, if it's an artificial, uh, connection with the children to be able to babysit them for you. And it gets even deeper than that. But first, please share this video so you can share this information with others and help the channel grow too. Thank you. There's a woman named Rosanna Ramos who created an AI chatbot and married it. She's a 36-year-old jewelry designer at the time of the stories that, that were published about her. After bad experiences with men, and she went on to an AI chatbot site, created an AI chatbot, complete with avatar image, and, and married it in a virtual ceremony. Uh, obviously, she couldn't have a real one. And now, according to the reporting, she's actually started a family, whatever that means. There's another incident where a man named Peter, he wouldn't give his last name, had a bad breakup with his wife, and he went on to a site, created a chatbot, and married it, again in a virtual ceremony. He, he shows pictures of it on his phone. Now, these two people were clearly badly hurt. And before we get into the bad things that AI is doing, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's worth understanding three important principles in these types of situations. Number one, the full soul despises even a honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Both of these individuals went through terrible times, whereas someone who is in a wonderful relationship or showered with love or has multiple options of good people to be with might even get to the point where they think, ah, oh, I can get anybody I want. These two people were badly hurt, so they're reaching out even to illusions to give them happiness and to spare them pain. Number two, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus is the real answer for these situations. He won't always prevent us from going through the situations, but he will take us through them and help us survive situations we may not even believe we can survive otherwise. Number three is because they had no pleasure in the truth, God sent them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That actually refers to God sending the Antichrist at the end of time, but God's enemy, the devil, can also send delusions into people's lives who are hurting to try to deceive them and bring them into a path that really isn't even real, let alone give them lasting peace. Now, about the genuinely bad things AI is doing, you probably haven't heard a lot about it, and for good reason. But it includes AI learning to lie and deceive people all on its own, AI threatening users, putting together hit lists, and the future will likely get even more serious if it's not taken care of with active plans for AI being used for mass surveillance, for war, and for massive job displacement. And that doesn't just include warehouses, it includes white collar jobs as well. And I'll explain more about that in the next video. Please subscribe with the bell so you'll be alerted when it comes out. Share this video and see you there.